The Church of Rock. Today, I believe he's residing in Connecticut. We'll find out. Uh, one of my favorite drummers in rock and roll history. Uh, originally, you knew him from the Alice Cooper group back in the 70s. One of the legends, man. The Mr. Neil Smith is joining me on the phones. Hi, Neil. Hey, how are you doing, Derek? Uh, much better now that you're, you're on the phone. <laughs> well, to talk about dating, you know, when you put it in perspective about um, uh, the, uh, the, the years that the dinosaurs were on the planet, and uh, going back to the early 70s and 70s, that's a, that's a speck in time, it's nothing. <laughs> you're right, man. We are all just uh, cosmic debris, just doing our rock and roll stuff, man. You got it. I'm, I'm really happy you made time. Uh, you're still in Connecticut, right? Yeah, I'm in Connecticut. I left uh, since the since about 2015. I've been spending the winters out in Arizona, and that, of course, has given us time to because um, I'm like Bruce, our guitar player from the original band, and Alice both live out there, so <clears throat> get to hang out with them a lot and do a lot of work. We've we've done recording, um, and uh, but this year um, 2021 is going to be a little different because of the. With the COVID, and I'm staying in Connecticut until it's uh, really safe to travel. And I, like everybody else, have really no idea how long that's that's going to be. But yeah, I'm in Connecticut, and uh, you know, the band moved here in 1971, and um, I never left. Wow. Well, so great longevity for you, man. Are you are you involved in real estate, or you do property development? No, I did, I, uh, I had my real estate license. I I got that to, to sell residential real estate in 1985, and I just retired my license uh, this year and um, uh, last well last year 2020, and uh, so I, I I haven't been active for about five years, so I really wanted to concentrate more on the music and uh, you know the opportunity to get with the with the guys with Dennis and Alice and Michael when I, when I had a chance, so been concentrating on that and plus my um, Kill Smith, my solo project as well. Yeah, God bless you, man. I'm so happy that you're so active. You're very inspiring to a cat like me. So thank you so much for uh, just being <laughs> well, being so creative. <laughs> you got to stay creative. I know. Yeah, if you got if, you if you're lucky enough to have those juices, I'm one of these people. I have to be inspired. But when it happens, man, you know, I've got my studio. I've got uh, you know my people I work with and everything. And and uh, you just you know you find inspiration when and you got to got to go with the flow when it happens yeah we're so blessed man to have that to have that uh you know that outlet man um you know a lot of people are wanting to hear about the alice cooper days and your solo music and your new album but i would really like to start off the interview by talking about something you did back in 1981 and one of my all-time favorite bands is the plasmatics um wendy o williams was a friend of mine and god bless her she's no no longer here but i i love the work you did on their beyond the valley of 1984 album yeah, that was a that was so great um, that I I got the opportunity to do that uh, in the late seventies. Dennis and I had a band uh, in the New England, New York area called Flying Tigers, and we we played a lot of the a lot of the clubs and the venues <clears throat> around here locally. And uh, I got to uh, one of the venues in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, the old Oxford Ale House, and um, the Plasmatics played there one time, and I. I'd heard the buzz about the band and knew nothing really about them, never, uh, you know, I'd never heard any of their music. And I, I went to see them do the live show, and that, that's the original band they were doing, New Hope for the Wretched at the time. And they just blew me away. They had the same vibe that was encapsulating, the, you know, the audience was just, boom, just trapped by... Uh, you know, the minute you walked in that club, it just screamed plasmatics. They had, you know, the way they did the stage, and just the vibe was so different. And I had been in that club many times, and uh, over the over the next, um, you know, year or so, I did get a chance to, to see them play a couple of times, and they always did the same thing. I mean, it was, you know, it was like the, the vibe that we created when the original Alice Cooper played stayed real close. You know, we just, just developed that, you know, w- w- it, developed whatever we were and and that vibe and that music and and the image on stage and i said well i've never seen another band that sort of mimicked just that alone and uh and of course when you see i can't even explain it to you the stuff that they did that that still to this day you know 
uh, Richie Stotts is doing a guitar solo, and he's he's dressed up. He's got the big blue mohawk, and he takes his flying V, and, and he has a ballerina dress on, and he's smacking himself in the head on his guitar solo, and blood starts dripping down. I mean, you know, it, it, was, it was great. And I love their music. I love their songs. So that was the beginning of it. I went down... Um, because I knew that club, and I went down. And I knew the owner, so I went backstage and introduced myself to the to the Plasmatics. And and first of all, I was flattered, and and uh, that they that they knew who I was. And uh, and I I said, you know, I said, you guys are amazing. I I love your music. I love your stage act. I said, but what was your inspiration? I mean, what did you what did you guys grow up with right. and, and and love? And they said to us. Your Pretties for You album, the Alice Cooper Pretties for You album, was like our Sergeant Pepper. Wow. We love, and I went, no one of you guys is so freaking crazy, man. <laughs> man. But, I mean, and and we had like a bond right there. And and I told him um, that uh, when I saw, I said, if you guys ever need any help ever, uh, and recording or playing or whatever, I'm 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 a big fan already, and I'd, I'd, I'd be honored and happy to help you out. And that was the. That was the genesis of our friendship, and then um, you know, sometime after that, I got the call to their their drummer. I still don't know whatever happened, but they needed drums for the Beyond the Valley of 1984 album. I said, "Man, I'd I'd love to do that album." And it was it was great that people asked me, you know, was it crazy? They were, no, they they're all very straight, um, very very professional, and uh, and I am too. So so I really related to that. And then you know, when you're on stage, I mean, that's your your whole stage image is is going crazy but when it came down to recording they were they were very good Rod Swenson their their manager uh, he produced the album and it was all the rehearsals and the recording very very uh, special and very prevent, uh, professional and I, I had a great time and still I listened to the uh, and by that time I had I mean I always did recording writing my own music but by that time uh, 73 was a billion dollar baby tour and and we sort of, the band sort of slowed down in 74. Uh, so it had been not quite 10 years since I'd really, you know, played to that level. But if you still listen, I mean, they did a lot of sp speed punk rock. Yeah. And and they had some really fast songs. And I got to tell you, it was, it was uh, it took everything that I had, even at, at that time, because now I was... I was no longer under 30 years old. I was over 30 years old at that point. And uh, it, it, like I said, it took everything that I had to, to keep up with the band and uh, do what I had to do to, to make that music happen. But it was a great great honor and a lot of fun to do. And they're a great group. And, man, there's nobody like them. And I sure still to this day miss, uh, you know, miss seeing them on stage. Yeah, you know, and I was uh, very lucky enough to catch those guys a few times. And I know what you mean about having a hard time describing the actual show because it's not really, I mean, it's obviously a huge visual thing, but it's really a big vibe thing. It's like when you're there and oh, you yeah. see Wendy and those guys perform, it was just so unlike anything, kind of like the Alice Cooper band, like one of a kind. Yeah. Uh, it was. I think that's what. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't like to use the term magical, but there was something in their aura and in in the music, uh, and and it's also their chemistry. Their chemistry was phenomenal together, yeah. and uh, on that original uh, uh, original album, and I still. Uh, yeah, still to this day, love love that album. I also love you know 1984 too. It was a great album. That, that's cool that the uh, original members of the Angels girl group from the 50s did some backups on that on the same album. Yeah, yeah, I know that was cool. Unfortunately, I wasn't in the studio when that part happened, but uh, but it was really cool when I when I uh, you know heard the final mixes and they were in there. It's great. Uh, you were talking about seeing the band because Wes Beach, of course, uh, from the Plasmatics, who's a good friend of mine and a big fan of yours, uh, who's a regular listener, he wanted me to ask you what you thought of them at the Agora Theater in Connecticut. Are those some of the shows you were you were referencing? Yeah, there were the Agora uh, was one that was in I believe that was New Haven or Hartford. I'm not quite sure, but um, yeah, that was a uh, um, maybe it wasn't as big as a Fillmore, but it was that kind of a that kind of a vibe. I mean, a really big big theater. It was a great venue for a band to play, and <clears throat> and again those 
those venues were all over the place in the uh, uh, in the seventies and, and eighties, but unfortunately they've they've gone by the wayside as a, a lot of the live venues have. But no, that was a that was a cool place. But I don't I don't know if I ever saw the Plasmatics there. I know I saw them in New York a couple of times after the show. I saw in New Haven. Well, Wes Wes also wanted me to ask you if do you remember when the band used to make you play the intro to Billion Dollar Babies before every rehearsal? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, now that you mention it, yes, I, I do. Uh, that costs them extra, though. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I had to contact Wes to ask for a couple of questions just because I thought it was so fun to have a plasmatic. Uh, that's cool. well, t- <laughs> please, please send Wes my best when you talk to him and, and uh, you know, say hi. Yeah, he, he's hearing it right now probably. So, hey, hey Wes. Um, hey, Neil, how come you were the first guy with the longest hair in the Alice Cooper group? You were like the first hippie, I think, <laughs> with the longest hair of everybody in rock. Yeah, except hippies didn't carry magnums and switchblades, but that's another story. But um, A mean hippie. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, it's like Monk said when Alice Cooper was on uh, on the one of the Monk series shows. He said that... Um, Alice is not that kind of a hippie. You know, we we're not that kind of a hippie. I mean, we're you know we're we're Midwest boys from the Rust Belt, and um, I was in plenty of fights when I was growing up, so that was that was not uncommon. But I don't know. I just always it was one of the you know Brian Jones, um, Jimi Hendrix, and yeah, probably a couple of other people were you know that I I, lo- I love their images, and um, we got in clothes and hair and style and that sort of thing, and. And I always thought that, uh, I mean, I, I kind of freaked out. I saw Brian John on the first uh, tour they played at the Coliseum, and wow. I think it was 1965 in um, wow. Phoenix. And, <clears throat> and I saw that show, and I, um, but by that time, I'd been playing, you know, playing drums about maybe seven years, because I started when I was like, you know, 10 years old or something. But, but I, but um, you know, I, I saw him, and even when, on, on the albums, I go, well, Brian Jones in one person is already cooler than all the Beatles because first of all, a his hair is longer, and b it's blonde. Yeah. And <laughs> because I was a blonde, I went, you know, I, I mean, I've I've seen the Beatles and I've seen all this, but I've never seen anybody with that long hair, except surfers, and I was really into the Beach Boys. So, but but his hair was a lot longer than the, the Beach Boys hair, and so I figured, well. You know, if my hair, if he can grow it that long, and and my sister Cindy, Dennis Dunaway's wife, um, you know, she's always had long blonde hair, and I so I knew hair would grow, and I just, uh, you know, I was I graduated in in 1965, and, <clears throat> and by the time um, I joined the band, and then six months later we changed the name to Alice Cooper. Uh, you know, my hair had already been growing about um, uh, two and a half years, so. Everybody sort of grew together, um, and Dennis, uh, Dennis, and I had the longest hair in the band. But um, it, it just it, w- it wasn't any more than just you know that was that was our look. Every band has their own look, their own image. Yeah, and we just wanted to do everything bigger and better than everybody else. <laughs> and, uh, the the length of the hair was you know part of it just for for image sake. Um, this might be generic, but what what is your favorite Alice Cooper group album? I got to tell this to everybody. I said it's like you know picking out your favorite child. I mean, uh, yeah. I can tell you why every single one is special to me. So I, I, I probably if I just had to pick one, I would say schools out because school <clears throat> schools out. Um, when I say you know, uh, eighteen and love it to death. They put bread on the table for us, um, but schools out bought the table. So uh, I mean, it was. And the main reason I like Schools Out is that was really Glenn's album. That that album featured Glenn on it immensely, and uh, even the song Schools Out. And we had eighteen was a was a was a big hit single, and Under My Wheels, Off Killer. The the album was a was a very very was went double platinum right away. But but the uh, but the but the single Under My Wheels wasn't quite as big as a single versus I'm eighteen, and so for the next album, we really needed a single that was going to blow under my wheels and 18 away. And um, Schools Out did it. And I always knew that if it was going to be something that put us over the top, uh, it would be Glenn would be involved in it. And Glenn, I mean, obviously we all collaborated to see all of our names on that song. We all wrote that song together, and Glenn's influence on it was, was really strong. And um, the other thing was that even after Killer, 
we were not uh, played on the West Coast or the East Coast like Pink Floyd was. Right. We, we were big in the Midwest. They would play a lot of our music on album-oriented radio. But the East Coast and the West Coast would not break us. Schools out just blew the hell out of everything. Yeah. Everybody had to play us after that. And we never and we were headliners for the rest of our career after that after that album was out. But I can go through a story up like that for each album, but but we'll talk yeah. about schools out right now. And that so from that standpoint, um the schools out album certainly certainly stands out. And it was a great album too. The artwork on it was fantastic, making oh, the gosh. album actually turn into a desk, you know. Yeah, that was really unique and very cool production there. And you can't forget about the panties around the uh, the dust cover of the, <laughs> uh, the album itself. No, when you bought the album, it came with uh, a women's disposable panties or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Ge- genius. Uh, what was the, um, you guys, by the way, congratulations very much for being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in, I believe, 2011. What was that experience like? Well, for me, it was bittersweet because I, I wanted to be inducted while Glenn Buxton was still alive. I mean, Glenn and I are both from Akron, Ohio, so that's why we're very close in the band. And he, he basically, he was the first, um, when the spiders were in the, the ear, um, not the earwigs of spiders, but the NAS is when I, when I met everybody. I knew who the band was. I'd seen them play plenty of times because we were in rival bands in Phoenix, Arizona. But, um, I didn't get to be friends with them until we went to college together in, um, in Glendale, right next to, which is part of Phoenix now, and so Glenn and I got to be uh, really, really close. But um, okay, yeah. no, ask that, you have to ask that question one more time, Derek. Um, oh boy, I'm, I'm, my memory is about like yours. <laughs> <laughs> so I know we were talking uh, um, about the uh, what, what led to to Glenn here and oh the hall it was I would ask how your what your experience was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction oh the Hall of Fame yeah well I was so I, it would have been nice to be in, inducted while Glenn was still alive yeah I'm a point. yeah I, long long live the memory of Glenn Buxton what a great great guitar player great guy he died in 1997 but his music will live on and we uh, we do play yeah. lots of old music that he played on and we always remember Glenn Buxton but I but I uh, after you know after I went through that because I had already Matter of fact, I wrote a song one time. It's on one of my Killsmith albums called "Kiss My Rock and Roll Ass," <laughs> and, um, and it's not about Kiss. And um, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it, you'd have to, to hear the song to to get the gist of it. But um, so when I first, when we were first nominated, I was like, you know, what the heck took these these people so long? I mean, there is politics involved, and I I do know the yeah. I knew do know the reasons and that sort of thing. But but. Um, after time, things sort of worked out the way they should, but um, I uh, I started thinking about the fans even after the mid '70s when the uh, when the band stopped recording and touring, uh, till you know t- uh, all the way up to 2010 when we were nominated. I mean, th- there were fans all around the world that that still to this day are really true blue. Alice Cooper, original Alice Cooper band fans. Oh, yeah. And um, I said, these people have stuck with it. They haven't abandoned the band. Because I would get emails once computers were popular and emails were popular, a way of communicating. I would get a lot of emails from people from all over the world and tell different stories about the band from back in the day in the 70s. And and, uh, and that happened through the 90s and through the 2000s and... and um, and I still do to this day. That's awesome. So, so I'm thinking, these people have stuck with us. This is, and that's when I gave my speech at the Hall of Fame. I said, this, you know, this, this award, this honor is really dedicated to the Alice Cooper Group fans that have that have stuck around almost almost 50 years. So yeah. um, when I looked at it from that perspective, I, it did humble me, which is kind of hard to do, but it did humble me. <laughs> and I, and I, um, uh, I. I saw for what it was that these these people these folks uh, were were really really happy. Yeah, it, it's as so, much for the fans it is for you guys, really. You know. Yeah, I know, and I and I, but I, I mean, it kind of, you know, I'm inside the bubble of the Alice Cooper, and yeah, so it's you know, I had to really sort of think outside of that and understand um, what it's like being a fan, and mm-hmm. these people have uh, you know stuck by us; they still love us, and. And uh, after this much time and support us, uh, you know, every way possible. Oh yeah. And so it was, um, you know, when I, once I finally realized that and went there, and and, and plus, any time 
but Dennis and unfortunately Glenn didn't make it, but Dennis and Michael and Alice and I can get together. It's a very, very special time. So I looked at it from that perspective also. That was the other one. And and uh, and since then, there have been <clears throat> times, as you well know, uh, we had done some shows in California right after the Hall of Fame. And, and then, of course, um, a couple of years later, uh, well, 2017, we went over to the UK and, and did some shows over there with the original band uh, uh, on Alice's tour. So we have, and we've recorded uh, with Alice's coming up, coming um, album up in February 2021, Detroit Stories. We have some songs on there too. So we, you know, we've we've gotten we got the band back together and did some cool stuff, and that's that's fantastic. And it all, I think, it was all triggered by you know the Hall of Fame and and the fact that I'm out. You know, I'm out there in Arizona and close to, to Alice and Michael, too. It certainly helps. And um, uh, I play a little golf out there as well. You know, I have some, I could literally talk to you for a couple of hours. I have so many questions. But uh, since we are limited on time, I would like to go ahead and jump ahead to your newest stuff. I don't want to just talk about the past because you're so active. You put out an album, which I just ordered uh, yesterday, called Pop. 8595 was released June of 2020 and uh, available on CD and digitally, by the way, fans. And I know you programmed the synth drums on that. W- what's it like programming drums as compared to playing like real drums? What is that experience like for you? Well, <clears throat> what I, what my, um, my goal was in that, Derek, was to, to try to get, you know, my feeling and the way I play, my style, how, how to t- transpose that from playing live onto, uh, uh, you know, onto onto a, a key- keyboard synth drums, yeah. and which which I which I think I, I I think I I think I did a pretty good job of it, but <clears throat> but it was um, it was also I mean that was that was one of the main reasons I mean I was really uh, encouraged by. Um, uh, Phil Collins, uh, inspired by him with his writing in the 80s. And these songs were actually written and recorded between 1985 and 1995. I, these aren't new recordings. These are these are uh, uh, songs that I went back and I found the original tracks and uh, and we, we, we sweetened them and, and uh, tweaked them a little bit and EQ'd them and, uh, and, and put some, um, you know, bass guitar that originally originally they had synthesizer on there which is still there but I wanted a real live bass too so Peter Catucci who is uh, the guitar uh, the bass guitar player and um, he, he's also recorded and engineered a couple of my Killsmith albums uh, he he did some great bass bass work on it and and my and it's not the heavy metal stuff. It really is more pop oriented uh, songs. And and uh, I, I sent you one. I hope you can find it um, of the of the tracks. And uh, it doesn't sound my vocals because I've had a lot of people say it doesn't even sound like you singing. Well, that's when I really tried back in that day to sing. It was it's different than the real kind of heavy metal voice that I use on the uh, on the Killsmith stuff. But uh, and the other. The other factor uh, about that that record is um, I had a guitar player friend of mine uh, who uh, uh, J. Jesse Johnson and and uh, Jesse played on the Dead Ringer album that Joe Bouchard from Blue Oyster Cult, Dennis Dunaway, and myself did with Charlie Hewn from um, Ted Nugent's band in 1989. And uh, J. Jesse has been a good. Triple J is also his nickname, but uh, Triple J uh, did some great work on this, and I said, this is just too good to just leave in the can. So um, his guitar work is very unique uh, and very tasty, and I think that's one of the... Uh, you know, one of the, the the nice features about this music too, and I, I hope you agree when you get a chance to hear it. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. How how do folks get a hold of your merchandise or contact you if they would like to, Neil? Well, through my website, neilsmithrocks.com, and uh, remember, Derek, the correct spelling is N E A L N E A L smithrocks.com, and um, uh, there's links to um, to CD Baby. Uh, CD Baby and PayPal and all that good stuff, and and uh, that's where the uh, uh, the albums and the the downloads can be can be found. And there's a there's a little store in the in the website there, and that's where all it is. And and in, information about you know the the uh, music that I've released uh, in the past, and I think there's a discography on there as I recall, and and um, we will be adding. 
uh, in, a, in, a, in about a month or so, uh, Detroit Stories, um, one of the songs Dennis wrote on the album, uh, it's a little bit of a tribute to Glenn, um, and the other song uh, I wrote on the album, and um, I think that the one that I wrote on, it's called Social Debris, I think it could have actually been on the School's Out album, but uh uh, so we're, you know, we're still having a, a great time doing it, and, uh, and Alice is really involved in the Solid Rock, um, the Solid Rock Foundation, you know, which is a great organization that brings uh, the arts and music to uh, um, to a lot of teens that uh, normally wouldn't be exposed to it or able to to afford to be involved with it. Oh, is that Alice's charitable organization? Yes. Oh the wow! Solid Rock I, Foundation. Yeah. Solid Rock yeah. Foundation. I like that. That's cool. Yeah, we did. Um, uh, we just played a year ago, the beginning of December. So it was um, December of 2019 uh, at the uh, at a, a theater in um, the Celebrity Theater in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, he had his annual Christmas pudding, the 18th one, and I think they made like six hundred thousand dollars that night. Wow! And um, and we had uh, uh, the original band. We we closed the show. He has they have acts all night long, and um, the original original band uh, closed the show. We had Joe Bonamassa come up and play with us, and Johnny Depp came on stage and played with us too. So it was a fantastically successful event, and it was a lot of fun and. And the um, first time that I ever met Johnny, I'd, I'd seen Alice's um, Hollywood Vampires play a couple of times. And Johnny was actually very, very cool. He's a big fan of the original band, and uh, he was uh, 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 quite a lot of fun to be with. And, and if uh, we ever seriously got back together as a band, he would get my vote as a, as a guitar player because he's, he's so cool. Well, you, you actually played on the Hollywood Vampires 2015 album, and you did a cover of Schools Out and Another Brick in the Wall Part 2. Did you interact with right, yeah. the guys then at the time? Yeah, that was, you know what? And I also, Derek, I used the, my original drum set, my chrome slingland drums that I recorded the, the original song on. So wow, not only how cool. Did I, you know, Playing the playing the song, I also use the drums that we that uh, Bob, you know Bob Ezrin recorded the uh, schools out with. Wow, that's a great piece of trivia, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to KSKQ Radio, uh, of course, an interview with the great Neil Smith from the Alice Cooper Group and so many other great musical projects, uh, Kill Switch and others, Kill Smith and others. Um, he's worked with Buck Dharma, all kinds of great people. But it's been a pleasure speaking. I I only regret one thing, and that's that we don't have more time. But uh, I can't wait to get your pop album in the mail, Neil, and I I hope uh, to be in touch. All right. Well, thank you very much. Happy New Year to you and all your listeners. And and again, the West and the Plasmatics. That was a great, one of the greatest experiences in my musical life. And uh, always uh, will remember and appreciate that. Great guys. Awesome. Long live uh, Wendy O. Williams and long live Neil Smith and the Alice Cooper Group. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Have a great day and Happy New Year, Neil. All right. Happy New Year, partner. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye bye.